we're going to talk about weaponizing your Raspberry Pi so that you can attack Michael with it because he's a that Debbie Downer. That is not what we're, that is no, <laughs> no, not. That is yeah. not what we're saying. No. So I've got some exciting news. Kali Linux 2025.2, a major update for ethical hackers and penetration testers has arrived and it's introduced 13 new tools, new pen testing tools for ethical hacking. You can ethically hack Michael so because I a, gave you permission. Out of the side of my, my peripheral vision, I saw Ryan hold up his hands and he was just pointing. And I thought he was air quoting of like ethical hacking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, may, I may have accidentally done that. Um, so this is really cool because this is compatible with Raspberry Pi. And so you can take this Raspberry Pi, this, I don't know, what are they, $35, $45, $55? $45, like I think, is this new base. Yeah. yeah, Very inexpensive little computer, and you can turn it into this incredible tool. Uh, you can install Kali Linux on it, and it's very easy to do. You get the ARM image, micro SD card, you flash it with Bolina Etcher or whatever you know flashing tool you want to use, and now all of a sudden you have access to these super powerful tools like InMap. Aircrack NG, uh, Burp Suite for network wireless, web testing, all these different Wireshark. things that you can do right there. Yes, Wireshark is available on Raspberry Pi. That is such a powerful, incredible tool. Mm -hmm. And you can run it right off a of Raspberry Pi, which is insane. So this is just a really cool project for you to do with your Raspberry Pi. And some of the new stuff on there and some of the existing stuff is just so cool. So I kind of put together some of the things that I had seen in the community that people were doing. Um, so they were basically using a USB Wi-Fi adapter with the BRC MF Mac Nexmon driver for monitor mode and packet injection, then using things like AirCrack NG for Wi-Fi cracking and AirDump NG and WLAN Oman to capture WPA2 handshakes. And then they're getting all of these different Hack 5 tools like these different Wi-Fi adapters and pineapples and different things and basically running all of that off of the Raspberry Pi. Now, take it from my personal experience being in cybersecurity uh, <laughs> classes for, for college and trying to play with some of these tools on my actual network. Not great. Got my whole internet Be shut careful off. Careful when yeah. you <laughs> use these tools. Set up Virtual machines, networking, yes. virtual machines, virtual network inside of it. Play with the virtual the network there, not your own LAN. Will not work out for you. <laughs> not work out well. You, know, you will keep Ryan off Metasploit. Yes, that's the one that got me. Uh, so uh, set up Open VPN on the Pi to create a secure VPN server. This one you could do safely for yourself. You could set up your own VPN server utilizing. Uh, open VPN right on your Raspberry Pi, which is super cool. And then this one really caught me, which is the automotive hacking is now a thing with Michael. You're going to love the greatest name. name, the greatest name, Carsonal. Carsonal. It used to be like Can Arsenal or something like that. And then they just turned Carsonal Carson. is such a good rebranding. Good job. Yeah. I, it's great. so good. Arsenal so, and car. I mean, it just it just flows good. so well. It's good. Whoever comes <laughs> up with this stuff, genius. You can leverage Cali NetHunter, Carsonal tools like IC Sim and Caring Caribou for automotive security testing, simulating CAN bus environments. Um, here's a little more information on the whole Carsonal hacking. Cars use something called a CAN bus, and that's how they communicate with all the different parts. All the monitoring of your engine, your brakes, your dashboard, all that stuff goes through that system. So Carsonal tools like care caring caribou can listen to this network and see what messages are being sent. Theoretically, if you know how the messages are being sent, you could intercept those messages and change those messages and make it do cool stuff that it wasn't supposed to do. Uh, and that's what people do. They hack like stuff. change so, the lights on it and, you know, mess with the lights mm -hmm. or make it go too fast. Turn the security off on your radio. You know how it won't let you watch movies on. Remember when I did the raspberry Pi and I integrated it into my Honda's dash and mm -hmm. every time you'd put it in drive, it would remove it out of the movie mode. However, right. you could hack that so that while you're in drive, it could still play movies, which is very dangerous, but it's fun. And yeah. <laughs> that's what matters. I also played video games in my car. You could run, you know, Do I had it. a controller hooked up and you could play it right from the middle dash. All kinds of cool stuff you can do. Hack your own stuff. While parked. 
while parked. Yes, exactly. Uh, also, because it has the GPIO pins, there's a lot of physical hacking that you can do with hardware relays, door locks, other things in there. And there's so much fun stuff that you can do with the Raspberry Pi. So, you know, I've got one of these flippers. These are very cool little hacking devices that you can play with as well. But Raspberry Pi is way cheaper than this thing. And you can still do a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, and it. also, uh, you didn't mention this in the notes, but the la the latest release also includes something that I just love the idea of it. Now, it's very specific. I think it only works on one smartwatch. I don't remember which one it was, but I, they have now the ability to run NetHunter on uh, on the smartwatches, or at least this one particular one, maybe more in the future. And it just makes me think of like the Dick Tracy character yeah. in the movies and like the cartoons and stuff about like you can have like your watch that does all these different things. We kind of have that now with the smartwatches in general, but to be able to do that kind of stuff, it like kind of brings it all together to make the full possibilities happen. It's super cool. Mm -hmm. Raspberry Pis are just one of my favorite pieces of hardware you can own. If you don't own a Raspberry Pi, you need to own one. That's what we would say if Raspberry Pi sponsored us, but since they don't... <laughs> There are also other boards out there that you can check out that are very cool too. That's what we that's what we would say, but also we, we it is great. Raspberry Pi is great. Yeah, we say it anyways because they're awesome. Love their stuff. So the next thing we want to talk about this week is a little bit of drama news, like a, a little bit. Ooh, I love drama. <laughs> so who did it? Was it Becky with the good hair? And, and it was uh, it was actually Charlene in accounting. And yeah. uh, I knew it, Charlene. She's always up to no good. <laughs> but really, I don't even know where that came from, but really Fedora, uh, there's a new change proposal for Fedora 44 that suggests dropping i686 support. Now, what does that mean? Well, basically stopping the inclusion of 32-bit libraries or multi-lib in x86-64 repos and stop building any i686 RPMs at all. Now, That's it. I'm done with Fedora. They're dead to me. I'll never use their distro again. I'm switching to a distro that cares about my libraries and Fedora ain't it. Wait, you said this is just a proposal. It is just a proposal. It is okay. just a conversation. All right. All right. I'm not mad yet, but I could be. You could be. That's what I would uh, say if it wasn't just. <laughs> <laughs> but for those who don't know, the proposal just means it's a discussion. They're not really impl implementing anything. It's just like they wanted to bring up this idea to discuss it and see what's the best uh, approach to do this sort of thing. So it is currently uh, being blown up way out of proportion on Reddit and YouTube videos and whatever. And um, they're suggesting that this is like some kind of like breaking support and compatibility and stuff like that. Now, if this were to have been done the way it was originally written, that would have been a problem. That would have caused issues by a lot. It would have, it would even have hurt Bazite, the uh, gaming uh, Universal Blue project to uh, have like a, having Steam built in and all this other stuff. It would have hurt that for sure if it was done in the exact way it was, it was proposed. But the whole point of proposing it is to find where the things need to be changed and where compromises can happen and if it's even a good idea. So I guess the idea is just to start the conversation to see where it goes. Uh, but whereas a lot of people are saying that it's already happening. And I, I even saw one saying that Fedora is destroying gaming and stuff like that. That's it's, it's just a conversation at this point. However, if they were done it the way that they talked about originally, it, it could have been bad for steam. And, and that's because steam is the steam client is 32 bit for some reason. Uh, I can't imagine why, but it is. And that's a, uh, that's the issue that would be caused by this for most people. Well, I imagine the Steam client's 32-bit because it still has to launch a lot of 32-bit applications. Well, no, Over because days. it's 64-bit yeah. on uh, Mac, I think. So, like, it doesn't have to be 32-bit. Hmm. Like, you can have 32-bit support. Like, Windows games are uh, somewhat thir some 32-bit, some 64-bit. Some applications are 32-bit, 64-bit, but they have a way to run 32-bit inside of 64-bit. So you could just run stuff... That's 32 bit inside of the 64 bit in the sense of like uh, Steam. So as the well. Windows so version is still yeah, 32 with, bit like, as well. Wow, 64 right. is, yeah. <laughs> right. And Steam, I get why Valve doesn't bother with that one, but um, like it, it just makes more sense in the future for the 64 bit, the 32 bit packages and the libraries to be taken away once there's no 
you know, fundamental feature that people want, depending on them, which is that at this point is basically Steam. So there are parts of Steam client that are 64-bit, and there are parts of it that are 32-bit. And according to these articles I'm seeing, the hybrid approach allows Steam to support the legacy games. Yeah. Right. In Windows, it's 32-bit with some 64-bit per- portions. of the. St- uh, there's no official 64-bit version of the Steam client in Windows. And it looks like for Mac OS, Steam has also been 32-bit, but has some 64-bit pieces in it as well. So I don't think anybody's fully 64-bit. I mean, that's just what I, my research showed that the Mac Your was, research was same, wrong. At so. the same, at the same time, I don't play games on Mac, so whatever. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Who plays games be. on Mac? Yeah, I don't there's know. not that I don't, many I don't available and, you know, be, I don't know anybody the developers don't want to develop for metal yeah. and yeah. all that. So, but, <laughs> but I think, I think that, you know, proposing something like this is fine. And like you said, this is where you have the discussion to say, here's the things we probably could kill off like Ubuntu did not so long ago. And here's the things that we need to keep to keep support. And I think it will be fine. Uh, If they went and did this now and then didn't have, then it would really put Fedora in a different spot. It would put Fedora in like a Mac OS spot where it's like, it's good for everything else, but if you game, don't use Fedora. Uh, But Fedora has spins that are focused on gaming so i just don't see this happening uh i think it's a cool proposal i think there's probably some things you can do uh, but eventually we do have to come to the realization that we can't support 32-bit probably forever so what's the solution here is it some type of emulation that we can run Maybe the, a translation you know, layer like windows yeah. does translation layer stuff but the the way i think that this is the the big issue is that people are blowing it up out of proportion and I wanted to bring it on the show to point out that it's not really that bad. Uh, there are recommendations of like what could be done and that sort of stuff, like using like technically you can use the flat pack with Steam. And like we talked about earlier, but the flat pack with Steam is missing the ability to use like VR headsets. It can't use the flat pack game scope. Mm-hmm. So it yeah. can't you can't use like the X server through the game scope session, uh, which limits, you know, the Bazite team in a lot of ways. Uh, and stuff like that. So there are f- a few things that the flat pack for Steam does not really provide, uh, and you would need like more traditional style RPMs or Debs, depending on your distro, to have all that sort of stuff. But it is something that eventually is going to happen. I do. The only thing I would say that is a little bit of a cautionary thing, because having this conversation with the developers and the other distributions and and like the universal blue team and all that sort of stuff. Having those conversations is good because you can figure out what's the best path to to go forward because you have to have these conversations in order to find out what the best path is. So totally uh, on board for that. I do think that the F 44 for Fedora 44 is a little bit too early to have that as like the marker because that's literally less than a year away. That's only like, Maybe eight months away. Does it give a lot of people time to yeah. switch over? Yeah. Right? I, I think I they agree. should just open that to be like a future potential Fedora release rather than a specific version because that's a way too close in my opinion. Yeah. And everyone remembers this is just like what Ubuntu did 27, uh, 27, excuse me, seven years ago, <laughs> trying to deprecate 32 bit all over again. <laughs> It's like well, this was life. this was slightly different. This was it, the, it was it is yeah. In the case <laughs> in the case of Ubuntu is that they accidentally included the stuff that Steam wanted, and yeah. then was like, oh, our bad, and then they kept it. So it's it's soon. Yeah. This this is more, but this is more like they're fully aware. But it's also just a conversation. So like, it's yeah, not a big deal in terms of like, and also the fact that if you read the forum thread that is about this particular topic, which by the way has a lot of comments, as you would imagine. Um, so if you read that forum thread, you'll see people saying stuff like, uh, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we got to a compromise and we know, uh, you know, we have ideas of where to move forward. So it, it does have some cordial conversation. I don't like that cordial yeah. stuff. That's not <laughs> for the internet. Cordial Aww. conversations are not for the internet. You need to be flaming hate and anger yep. and rage monsters is all that the internet is for is really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to have yeah. the rage. In fact, Jill was protesting this weekend. Uh, on the street corner with signs about this thing. She In fact, said, she was so door intense. removed 32, we hate you. That was yeah. her chance. <laughs> yeah, she was so into that protest. She didn't just hold a sign. She got one of those spinning arrows that you spin around your head and stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was- yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Fedora, 
<laughs> Bad move. <laughs> yeah, but the you know the truth is it's just like what what uh, Michael and Ryan were talking about earlier. This step is just too drastic, and the pieces are not in place to support 32 bit removal just yet. But Even I think that's you know why it's important. <laughs> it's to have important these proposals. to have have the conversation, right? And. And this is good because I think the community outcry will actually stop it from happening since it still is a propo- in the proposal phase. But we got to think about these things for the future. And it's, yeah. it's so true. We've Eventually, move. this will happen. Yeah. Just hopefully not Fedora 44. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully Valve will make a fully <laughs> uh, 64-bit Steam. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, Fedora will make the right decision here. They generally yeah. do. So I'm not worried yet. But if they do do it, just know Jill will get a sign in front of your building <laughs> and protest. Well, you do well, not want to disappoint Jill. <laughs> just <laughs> keep that we in get mind. what we want on this show by just threatening the use of Jill a lot. <laughs> yes. Disappointing you know? Jill. We threatened that, that they're going to disappoint Jill. And then that's what we get what we want because we're just, <laughs> they never cared before Jill joined the show when I would say I'm disappointed in X, Y, Z. But as soon as, as soon as Jill joined, then they started caring, you know, because how many times did I go on big rants on the show before Jill joined and nobody cared, Michael, <laughs> I did make it into release notes. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm pretty sure that was before Jill. The yeah. Ubuntu Mate yeah. thing. I think that was before Jill. Yeah. So I guess my rants matter. So like so like once. Once. Yeah. Once <laughs> my rants matter. <laughs> Just so they control me. Uh yeah, exactly. speaking of Flat Hub, there's an awesome app called Jasmine. I want you guys to check out. It is very unique. I don't know what to think about it yet, but I want you yeah. all to check it that's out a, and write us and let us know what it. you think of it. Yeah. It's a comprehensive web launcher and session management application. It takes all of your scattered bookmarks and browser tabs and organizes them into a launchable workspace. It's very much geared towards productivity enthusiasts and multi-account managers. So people who have a lot of social media accounts and other things that they're managing, you can basically set up all these different profiles and have the different bookmarks there and be able to set everything up. Also, like if you're switching browsers a lot, which you may be, you know, you'd have something to store all of your bookmarks in one place. So you don't have to worry about, you know, trying to transfer your bookmarks over. Although most browsers make that pretty simple. So you get things like smart bookmarking, store websites with titles, URLs, comments, favicons, login references, session management, private profile system, isolating your browsing environment for multi-account management, multi-account support. Um, So simultaneously access multiple accounts on the same service without conflicts. It's got a built-in browser to it as well. Built-in download manager, 2FA integration, screenshot capture, master password protection, and like I said, if you have multiple Gmail accounts, GitHub profiles, social media accounts, and you want to isolate all those from each other, each private profile operates as a separate browser with its own cookie, login sessions, and browsing data. So it's kind of a really cool way to keep all of that stuff sandboxed, Michael, which works really well. Sandboxing does. Anyway, so this is a cool idea. <laughs> this is a cool idea. I, I mean, I, I'm like you said, I don't know how exactly how I feel about it because certain parts of it are really cool concepts. And then you also look at the UI and it looks like it was made 10, 15 years ago. It's not and, a great UI, but it's a yeah. great no. concept. It yes. is a great concept. So there's there's also some other tools that have existed in this space of having like multiple, like not everything. This does a lot more than the other ones do. But the idea of having like all your applications and all your accounts for a particular service kind of merged together in just one application, uh, you know, like Twitter tweet deck kind of thing back in the day. Or uh, there was yeah. this oh, one. Those were the days, Michael. Yeah. Yes. This new I stuff is poppy deck. crop, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Croppy crop, whatever. Uh, yeah. the, there was also uh, an application, I won't name it because I don't want to give it any promotion, that was open source. I used it. I helped uh, contribute to it. It was great. Then they decided, hey, we're going to close source it because screw you for helping us and that sort of thing. So uh, those things happened, and that's a shame. Um, but I like the idea of having a single application where I can have multiple things just ready to go in like a workspace and just load it all up like I want all my Mastodon accounts to load up all at once and be able to manage with them and interact with them all at one time, which is really cool. How many people do you pretend to be, Michael? You have so many Mastodon accounts. I don't pretend. I pretend to be me. 
And then I also post as Destination Linux and as This Week in Linux and as Tux Digital and et cetera. So, mm. but I still just pretend to be me, just one. Interesting. 